I heard about a middle-aged couple who were sitting together on the couch. She was actually sitting on the couch, and her husband was laying on the couch with his head in her lap. And she took off his glasses and looked down at him and said, you know, when I take your glasses off, you look just like that handsome kid that I fell in love with 25 years ago. And he said, yes, and when you take my glasses off, you look pretty good too. <laughs> you know, time changes us on the outside, but if you saw the picture on John's blog of his dad, it didn't change that much. He's pretty young looking. Time changes us on the outside, but it need not change us on the inside. And that's why marriages last 69 years. I heard about a couple of Bible college students who went out to serve at a church one weekend, and it was in the north, and it was cold, and it started to snow on the way. In fact, they experienced a blizzard on the way out. Their car got stuck in that blizzard. They couldn't move. So they sat in the car with the heater on until it ran out of gas. And then they got out and they walked and walked until they came upon a hunter's cabin in the woods. There was no heat. There were no beds. All they found was a sleeping bag and a cot. These two male-female Bible college students. So he let her use the cot, and he put blankets on top of her, and he got into the sleeping bag. Well, five minutes later, she said, I am freezing. And so he unzipped the sleeping bag, he got out, he put more blankets on her, and he got back in the sleeping bag, zipped it back up. Five minutes later, she says, I'm sorry, but I am still freezing to death. He said, look, we're in the middle of nowhere. Why don't we spend the night as husband and wife? She said, okay. He said, okay, get up and get your own blanket. <laughs> that explains marriage a lot better, doesn't it? <laughs> I heard about the Vatican bought a new limousine for the Pope. And it was beautiful. It was long and sleek, and it had tinted glass. And the Pope came out to see that limousine, and he was impressed. He said, you know, I haven't driven a car in years. I want to take this car for a spin. And so he drove that limousine out into the streets of Rome, but he got carried away. He was going 55 in a 35-mile-per-hour zone, and he got stopped. The policeman came up to the car and was kind of shocked when he looked in the window. He said, Your Holiness, could you wait right here for a minute? The policeman went back to the squad car and called headquarters. He said, Chief, I know there's supposed to be a mandatory fine for anybody going 20 miles over the speed limit, but... I just stopped somebody really important. I need to know what to do. The chief said, well, is he more important than the president of Italy? The policeman said, yeah, I believe he is. Well, is he more important than the president of the United States? He said, yeah, I believe he is. The chief said, well, who is he? The policeman said, I don't know who he is. He said, you don't know who he is. What do you mean you don't know? Who is that important? He said, I don't know who he is, but his chauffeur is the Pope. <laughs> Isn't that the way the world evaluates importance? We are so impressed with people and power and prestige. But God evaluates our importance equally by the use of one word. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Cleopatra's needle. That picture will be on the screen. Workers constructed this 
huge column. 3,500 years ago as a gift for an Egyptian pharaoh. But on September the 12th, 1878, the British government planted this granite column in English soil and assigned it vigil over the Thames River in London. A minister by the name of Frank Borum, which is really a bad name for a minister. Maybe you've heard some of his relatives. Frank Borum was there to watch this 3,500-year-old relic lifted from horizontal to vertical. Now, he was not a minister at that time. He was only seven years old. But he described this great granite column smothered with hieroglyphics. Pharaohs had passed by it on chariots. Moses perhaps had studied on its steps. And now it stood on a London waterway. Someday, perhaps Britain will go the way of ancient Egypt. And excavators may open this huge box to discover a slice of Victorian life. And when they do, they will discover at the base of that column a set of coins, children's toys, a city directory, pictures of the 12 most beautiful women in the world at that time, and in 215 different languages, one verse from the Bible. What verse do you suppose? Today I want us to look at that one word, whoever. Circle that word. Put a, put a star by that word. That one word unrolls the welcome mat of heaven. Whoever invites the world to God. Now, Jesus could have narrowed the scope, changing whoever to whatever, whatever Jew believes, whatever woman follows. But Jesus used no qualifier. After all, who isn't a whoever? Jesus used this word several times when he spoke. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Verses later, Jesus said, Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The next book of the Bible, Mark 3, Jesus said, Whoever does God's will is my father and sister and mother. And later in that book, Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Two books later, Jesus would say in John 3, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. A lot of people fit that category. John 4 Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst, will never die. John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. John 11, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And this same writer, the Apostle John, in the last book in the Bible, in the last chapter in the Bible, in Revelation 22, John wrote, whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. God's gospel has a whoever policy. The apostle Paul worded it this way in Titus 2, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Peter worded it this way in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. We need to know this. The downturns of life create such a sad state of affairs that we wonder sometimes if God wants us. Now, in revealing His whoever policy, Jesus told three stories. Three stories. The first story that Jesus told is in Luke, the 16th chapter. 
Jesus told a story about a man named Lazarus and a rich man who is not named. Now, most all of Jesus' story, in fact, every one of Jesus' parables, every one of Jesus' stories have names or have no names except this story. This is the only story that Jesus told that has names. And I believe it's because they were real people and not made-up people. In Luke 16, verse 19, Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Contrast Lazarus with the rich man. The rich man lived in luxury. The King James Bible says he fared sumptuously. But he didn't just fare sumptuously, he fared sumptuously every day. I like steak. I'm not sure that I would like it every day. But this man fared sumptuously every single day. Contrast with him, Lazarus, who was a beggar. He ate the leftovers. He ate the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The rich man lived in comfort. Lazarus lived in sores. Maybe Lazarus is an exception. Lazarus doesn't qualify. Well, the curtain falls on Act 1 and lifts on act 2 and in luke 16 verse 22 the bible says the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to abraham's side the rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment he looked up and saw abraham far away with lazarus by his side the rich man was buried it was probably an expensive funeral It does not say that Lazarus was buried because he probably wasn't. Those who were like Lazarus were simply taken and thrown under the garbage heap in Jerusalem outside the city. But I want you to notice that their fortunes switched at death. Death switched their fortunes. The rich man is in torment. Lazarus is in comfort. But the rich man has not changed as much as we would hope that he had changed. Because he would later ask Abraham, send Lazarus to go dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue. See, Lazarus in his eyes is still a servant. Someone said the world, if you're a Christian, is all the hell you'll ever experience. And if you're not, This world is all the heaven that you'll ever experience. Well, there are three aspects of this one word that I want us to get today. I want you to write down three words. That's it. Number one, whoever means however. Whoever means however. God takes you however he finds you. There is no need to clean up. There is no need to climb up. Just look up. You see, God's whoever policy has a however benefit. Lazaruses still populate our planet. In fact, you may be one, not begging for bread, but struggling. So you may ask, does God have a place for people in my place? And the answer is yes. I heard about one of our missionaries who was coming home from China before World War II, before when China was still open at that time to missionaries. And this man was a medical missionary riding on a train with four salesmen. And he was trying to think of some way to bring up the subject of Christ to those salesmen. So he brought out a map of China from his briefcase and he told them where he had been and what experiences he had had. But when he began to press the claims of Christ, three of the salesmen got up and left. Only one remained. He turned to the one and he said, don't you want Jesus as your Savior? The man said, oh, I don't know, Doc. Uh, Yeah, I think I've always wanted to be a Christian. But what difference does it make? So the old missionary opened his Bible to 1 John, the second chapter, and he read these words. 
My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The old missionary explained that word advocate literally means defense attorney. One who stands in our place, one who advocates on our behalf, a lawyer that never loses a case. And that word Propitiation means a covering. And that when we accept Christ as our Savior, we have an advocate and we have covering for our sins. The salesman said, I, I, Doc, I don't know about that. I, I guess I can see that, but I don't know if I can live the life. He said, Doc, tell me, Doc, suppose I become a Christian and then I skid. What happens if a man becomes a Christian and then he skids? Well, the old doctor thought about it a minute, and then he opened his Bible to the same passage of Scripture. And he said, My little children, these things I write to you that you skid not. But if any man skids, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our skids, and not for ours only, but for the skids of the whole world. That explains however to me second whoever means whenever god's whoever policy has a whenever clause whenever you hear god's voice he welcomes your response and jesus told a story about this he told a story about god's 11th hour grace in matthew the 20th chapter jesus told a story about a man who owned a vineyard and went at 6 o'clock in the morning to appeal at the marketplace for workers in his vineyard. And he hired some, but he didn't hire enough, so he went back at 9 o'clock in the morning, he hired more. He still didn't have enough. He went back at noon and hired more, at 3 o'clock and hired more in the afternoon. Even at 5 o'clock, one hour before quitting time, this landowner went to the marketplace and hired workers. But the men hired early grumbled when the landowner paid the one-hour workers the same as he paid them. We can understand that in America, can't we? That was not fair. But that's what grace is. Grace is not fair fair it just isn't god's whoever policy has a whenever clause the third the third aspect is whoever means wherever Where, wherever you are you're not too far from home Jesus told this story in Luke, the 15th chapter. It's so familiar, I don't even have to tell you the story. You know it. Charles Dickens calls this story the finest short story ever written. The prodigal son assumed he was too far from home to come home. He had rejected his father's love. He had journeyed to a far country. He had wasted his father's inheritance. Now that word wasted here is the same Greek word used to describe the action of a seed-sowing farmer. Envision this farmer casting handfuls of seed into toiled earth. Envision the prodigal tossing his father's money to greedy merchants. A roll of bills at one club, a handful of coins at another. He rides a magic carpet of cash from one party to the next. And then his wallet grows thin. The credit card comes back. And he slides from a head hog at the trough to low pig in the mud. And he finds employment feeding pigs. Not a recommended career path. The hunger so gnaws at him that he considers eating with the pigs. But rather than swallow the pods, he swallows his pride. 
And he begins that famous homeward walk, rehearsing a repentance speech with every step. Turns out he didn't need it because his father was waiting and watching. Unlike the story that Jesus had just told about the shepherd, one sheep out of a hundred leaving, and the shepherd going after that sheep. Unlike the woman who lost a coin out of ten important coins that she had, she went and swept the house to find that coin. This father didn't leave. He didn't go after the son. Probably wouldn't have done any good, would it? The Bible says in verse 20 of chapter 15 of Luke, his father saw him, had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son did not need that speech because the father smothered his face into his breast. In fact, this is the only time God is pictured in the Bible as running. Only time. He's in a hurry to forgive. Whoever means however, whenever, wherever. Reader's Digest told about a lady named Emma, a lady suffering from dementia who was being moved to Florida by her daughter to live in a mobile home so that the mom could be close to the daughter and the daughter could keep an eye on her. And as they traveled southward on I-75 to Florida, they passed a brand new mobile home being towed down I-75. And the daughter joked to Emma, there goes our house. But they passed not only that mobile home, but a caravan of seven identical trucks rolling southward. And as they passed the last truck hauling a trailer, Emma said, and there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Regardless of your neighborhood, God has a policy for you. I love to hear my wife say, whoever. Sometimes I detect my favorite fragrance coming from the kitchen, chocolate chip cookies. And I follow the smell like a bird dog follows a trail until I'm standing over the just-baked cookie. Who are these for, I ask? For a birthday party. Don't touch. For a friend. Stay away. But sometimes she might say, whoever. And since I qualify as a whoever, <laughs> I say yes. No status too low. No hour too late. No place too far. That's God's policy. Milton Cunningham was a missionary, and he was flying on a plane from Atlanta to Dallas. And when he sat down on the plane, he sat next to a little girl who was sitting by the window who obviously had Down syndrome. This young girl began to ask him some simple but offensive questions. The little Down syndrome girl turned to Cunningham and said, Mister, did you brush your teeth this morning? <laughs> Cunningham was shocked at the question. He squirmed a little bit. He said, well, yes, I brushed my teeth this morning. The young girl said, good, because we're all supposed to brush our teeth. Then she said, Mr., do you smoke? Again, Cunningham was a little uncomfortable, but he told her that he didn't smoke. Good, because smoking will make you die, she said. And then she said, Mr., do you love Jesus? Cunningham was really caught by the simplicity and forthrightness of her questions, and he smiled and said, yes, I do love Jesus. And the little girl with Down syndrome smiled and said, good, because we're all supposed to love Jesus. About that time, just before the plane was ready to leave, a stranger came, a businessman came, and sat on the aisle seat. So get the picture. There's the Down syndrome girl at the window, Cunningham in the middle, 
and the stranger who came and sat down and he was reading a magazine. The little girl nudged Cunningham and said, Mister, ask him if he brushed his teeth this morning. <laughs> Cunningham was really uneasy. He told the little girl, I don't want to do that. But she kept nudging him, ask him, ask him. You know that wasn't going to stop. And so he said, Mister, I don't mean to bother you, but my little friend over here wants me to ask you if you brushed your teeth this morning. Well, the man looked startled, but he looked past Cunningham, and he saw the young girl sitting there. He could tell her good intentions, and so he took the question in stride and said with a smile, well, yes, I brushed my teeth this morning. As the plane taxied onto the runway and began to take off, the young girl nudged Cunningham a second time and, and said, ask him if he smokes. <laughs> Again, Cunningham turned to the man and said, my little friend here wants me to ask you if you smoke. And he assured the little girl that no, he didn't smoke. As the plane was lifting into the air, the little girl nudged Cunningham a third time and said, ask him if he loves Jesus. And Cunningham said, I can't do that. That's too personal. I don't feel comfortable saying that to him. But the little girl smiled and said, ask him, ask him. Cunningham turned to the fellow one more time and said, now she wants me to ask you if you love Jesus. Well, the man could have responded the same way as he did the two previous questions but he didn't didn't have a smile on his face didn't have a chuckle in his voice and finally he said you know in all honesty i can't say that i do it's not that i don't want to it's just that i don't know how to i really don't i've wanted to be a person of faith all my life but i just don't know how to do it and now i've come to a place in my life when I need that very much. And as the plane soared through the skies between Atlanta and Dallas, Milton Cunningham listened as this fellow poured out his heart, his brokenness, his lostness. And Cunningham shared his own testimony. And he explained how to be a person of faith. He did that all because a little girl with Down's syndrome asked him to ask the fundamental question that we, every one of us, have a responsibility to in some way articulate. Do you love Jesus? Because look at God's policy. Whoever, however, wherever, whenever, stand together and let's pray father in heaven we are so grateful that you have this policy but we know that for people who are lost who maintain their lostness who refuse to consider themselves a whoever who wait too long are in danger Father, we pray that our being here today has motivated each one of us to take that policy and apply it. We pray in Jesus' name.